of usage. But they're still very confused and and concerned and, and a little <laughs> heated under the collar, if you would be, right? So a guide like that, even if it's just to us, right, would be helpful. Um, although I, I, I think, you know, I looked at two of the five bills myself and determined that it was just usage, but it'd be useful to have some sort of guide like that. Thank Always you. Um, Tom. <laughs> What's that? Thank you for that. Let me just make a couple of statements here. First of all, to the team, we, I do see that I do see confirmation at the top of my screen that meeting recording is now in progress. So we have now resolved that issue satisfactorily. Um, before we move any further, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Ann Kennard is raising her hand, and I assume that you are raising your hand to uh, respond to the uh, the assistance that Tom Corso was talking about. Is that correct, Ann? Hey, Yvonne, it's actually Deanna. Uh, Kristen, oh. Ann, and I are in a room socially distant, so, uh, <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Uh, and and thanks go. for the opportunity. So, Tom, I appreciate your question, and then uh, though we are, we do have a response that we're working on for the customer. Uh, and I would say there's a few things that we absolutely can share. We have the um, uh, conservation guide that our corporate communications team has done a really great job on pulling together. Uh, we also have some information that we uh, can direct customers to. We'll be more than happy to talk to any customer that uh, anybody on the team gets uh, to. We can reach out to them just like we do with every other customer if you want to filter that through and, and Yvonne knows how to get it uh, to, to our team. And I would say on top of that, the two biggest things that I am continuing to uh, try and advocate for in any media opportunities that I get, is it's really the proactive management of your bill. So customers can call us at 210-353-2222. And whenever they talk to us, there's two key things that we, I, I would say, that we can do on top of adding specific energy advising tips. One of which is helping sign up for high bill alerts. So before you even get that high bill, if someone's bill usage is trending up, they can sign up for an alert uh, to let them know to get that update. And it also directs them to different things they can do specifically for energy conservation. And the second piece is uh, we can sign customers up on a budget payment plan which helps alleviate the highs and lows. So basically what we do is we average out your prior 12 months uh, usage and then add a, a little bit of kind of to help with any fluctuations in usage through weather and, and fuel costs and that sort of thing. Uh, and so each month you have the same amount due and at the end of that period, there is a process where we go through and, and what we call a true up, right? So we make sure that you, uh, that if someone's usage has changed over the years that we are uh, appropriately uh, addressing, uh, accommodating for that. But um, mm -hmm. again, I appreciate your, your comment. We are seeing increased usage uh, and we're, our communications team has been putting together some really good uh, tools for that. And I think uh, we can make sure that we share that with you. But at the same time, if there's a customer concern, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll be happy to work with them. Perfect, thank you so much. Great answer. All right. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I apologize for the slight delay. Um, just a few housekeeping comments, um, Julia. I'd like I'd like for you uh, or you know to just to finalize the roll call here in just a moment. Um, you know after chair day calls the meeting to order. Uh, but again, uh, you, some of you may already be aware as we were in pause mode for just a few moments that uh, our interim president and CEO, Mr. Rudy Garza, uh, will be joining us for the beginning portion of this meeting as as far as his schedule will allow. And I'd like to thank Rudy for being here with us today. It's always a pleasure, Rudy, to have you with us. Um, you know, if anyone has any questions for Rudy, please feel free to input your questions in the chat feature. Um, Melissa Carrillo-Cox, who's on my team, will flag me that we have questions and we will make sure to have, uh, you know, give Rudy the opportunity to respond to them. Uh, we also have several members of our CPS Energy team here, uh, and they may also be, uh, you know, able to support responses as well for a robust dialogue. So again, thank you, Rudy, for being here. And again, if you have questions for Rudy, please put them in the chat. Um, and again, just a couple more things before Chair Day calls this meeting to order. Um, you know, I thank you all for your flexibility in allowing us to, you know, uh, you know, convert this meeting to 100% WebEx today. So because we are doing 100% WebEx, just want to remind everyone that, uh, you know, please remain on mute when you are not speaking. 
Um, if you'd like to ask any questions at all, please utilize the raise the hand feature. Uh, Melissa Creo Cox will flag that your hand is up if, in case I don't see it. Uh, and then we, and then you can take yourself off mute to ask your question and, and place yourself back on mute. Again, we are recording today for the first time today. And then uh, in the subsequent days, we will be posting the recording on our CPS Energy website on the CAC page. With that, uh, Chair Dale, uh, you can call the meeting to order, and then uh, Julia will finalize that we have quorum and roll call, and then we will move on. Thanks, Yvonne, and uh, appreciate everybody working on the technical issues. Uh, I'm glad we have everybody with us today and we're recording. Uh, I do call the meeting to order, so we can go on to the um, roll call. I would appreciate it. Thanks, Chair Day. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to call everyone's name. I do show that everybody is here with the exception of Lawson, Diana, Mary Dennis, and um, Andra. And if that is incorrect, I missed you, please tell me. Or I should say, if you are here and I counted you absent, but we have um, just four people that are not present at the moment. Lawson did indicate she would be joining later in the meeting, so I will turn it um, over to I think Melissa is going to do our invocation and pledge of allegiance. Thanks, Julia, we'll begin with our invocation, and we can please bow our heads. We are thankful for this day that you have given us for its blessings and opportunities to make a difference. Thank you for the opportunity to be involved in useful work and for the honor of very important responsibilities. We ask that you provide guidance to our CAC members in their thoughts and actions so that we may have a successful meeting with the Citizens Advisory Committee for CPS Energy. Help them accomplish their goals and display your character. Help us to be good, to be honest, to serve others, and to fulfill our obligations to our community. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Now, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for that uh, invocation, the Pledge of Allegiance. And just to very quickly go through a few things, Chair Day, uh, as far as safety message for today, I have office space, avoid trips and falls. Uh, data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention suggests that falling is not only the most common office accident, but also is responsible for the most di disabling injuries. Furthermore, office workers are two to two and a half times more likely to suffer a disabling injury from a fall than other workers. Know the risks and follow these tips for prevention. And I think the first one is the biggest one. Look before you walk. Make sure the walkway is clear and never walk while using a cell phone. Um, I would also say, you know, when you're outside walking on the sidewalk, I would say that's even more important then as well. Uh, close your desk drawers as soon as you're done using them. Report hazards like loose carpeting, electrical cords to anyone who's going to have them fixed. And clean up spills even if you didn't cause the spill. Pick up objects from the ground and stay vigilant to fall hazards. Uh, don't, uh, don't stretch to reach something when you're seated. Stand up instead. And lastly, use a stepladder, not a chair, to reach something overhead. That concludes today's safety message for today. Um, as far as staff update, you know, at the bottom of your agenda, as always, we listed, you know, when our next rate advisory committee meeting is, which is next week on the 21st. Um, I highly recommend that if you can listen in to the meeting, it begins, it's from three to six. Uh, generation planning, uh, you know, conversation will be had during that meeting. So I think it would be a great opportunity for you to listen in or subsequently when the meeting recording is posted. Um, you know, the, uh, on Monday, the uh, Board of Trust, July 25th Board of Trustees will have their regular scheduled meeting. Of course, the next meeting for the CAC is scheduled for August the 10th. And also, I encourage you all to, whenever possible, to take a look at cpsenergy.com for upcoming events. We do have three community events planned uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, August 4th at Comanche Park is a small and medium business support fair. Uh, then we have on July 14th, which is tomorrow, uh, a community program fair for District 2. It's at the Pre-K for SA East Education Center on Eisenhower Road. On July 27th, we will be doing a community program fair for Bear County Precinct 4 at uh, Calvary Baptist Church. 
And August 3rd, there is uh, the first of probably additional events to come relative to back to school. Uh, City Council District 5 will be having a back to school event. And the CPS Energy team uh, stuffed, um, I don't know, was it hundreds or a couple of thousand uh, backpacks last week with school supplies to support uh, back to school efforts for the community. Uh, this is something that we do every year, and, this, and we definitely enjoy providing that support to our local students. Um, that is everything for me, sir. Uh, Bill Day, you get to proceed with the approval of the minutes and then followed by Mr. Benny Etheridge on generation planning update. Okay, thanks, Yvonne. Appreciate that. Um, I hope you all have had a chance to review the minutes from our June meeting. Uh, does anybody have any amendments, changes, or additions to the minutes from last month? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I so move to approve the minutes. I second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thanks. Uh, Yvonne, I'll turn it back over to you for an introduction of Benny. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Benny Etheridge is with us today to give us a generation planning update, and he will also touch upon some new and emerging technologies you know, that are on the horizon for our generation planning consideration and future portfolio. Uh, Mr. Benny Etheridge, again, our Executive Vice President of Energy Supply, which includes the power generation side of the business, uh, nuclear oversight, uh, and include the, our, you know, the oversight uh, of our ownership of the South Texas Nuclear Project, and also energy supply and market operations, which is, uh, you know, uh, are buying and selling of power onto the market, purchase power agreements, and of course, monitoring ERCOT market conditions. Um, so uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Etheridge for today's update. And but before we turn it over to Benny to start, Melissa, do we have anything in the chat to be aware of? No, ma'am, we did have a message from Diana apologizing for being late, but she is <laughs> on today. <laughs> good. good to see you and you look great, thank you. All right, Mr. Benny Etheridge, take it away, sir. Okay, thank you, Yvonne, and good afternoon, folks. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you a little bit about our generation planning process. Uh, I haven't met many of you, and I hope to be able to change that in the future. I've, I was looking forward to an in-person meeting this time, but perhaps down the road. So today I've got a brief presentation. As Yvonne indicated, I'd like to provide a brief update on where we are in generation planning. And for some reason, I'm not shifting gears here. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Operator error, folks. So what we'll do is talk a little bit about our timeline and update, and then we're going to talk about some emerging technology. I understand you all have uh, some interest in that. I'm really glad to hear it. Diversity has always been a big part of our fleet and will continue to be in the future, uh, and we're working towards that. Uh, the bottom line is we've got about 3,000 megawatts we're going to need to replace, and not to in distant future. This is a quick timeline we put together. We kicked things off in 21, this initiative we're on today. And by the end of this year, we expect to provide input to our board to help them make a decision on our next steps in terms of uh, generation build out procurement. This is a context setting slide you're looking at here. Uh, wanted to give you some idea of what our evolution has looked like over the years. Back in the, the 70s, we were 100% natural gas here. That, uh, that gave us reliable generation, but we were seeing price pressure. And so across the U.S., you saw people building out coal. So by the 80s, we, we had replaced a significant amount of our generation with coal. That evolution continued. We picked up nuclear in the 90s. And today, when you look at our fleet, we have a strongly diversified fleet, still, still heavy on natural gas, again, because of its flexibility and relatively low cost in the, in the Texas market. But we've certainly changed as a, as a community. We've gone from a, a load of 1,100 megawatts to well over 5,000 now. In fact, earlier this week, we, we set a record over 5,200 megawatts. So demand is continue, continuing to go up. This slide here is intended just to give you a cross-section of our existing portfolio. Uh, as I said, diversity has always been important to us. It, it protects our customers, which is our number one goal. Reliability and affordability, 
in an environmentally responsible manner. So as you can see here, we, we've got wind farms, uh, combined cycle units, peaking units, uh, more combined cycles, solar. We've even got a, a new battery storage project that we're working with out at Commerce. It's a partnership we've got with Southwest Research and its Institute. Help us learn a little bit more. Over the next few years, by 2030, we're going to see some plants leave our fleet and we've got to replace that generation. So technologies that are currently uh, an option for us, wind and solar, you're familiar with those, I believe. We've talked about doing a coal to natural gas conversion. We're looking at that. Natural gas is appealing in part because it can transition to hydrogen in the future. All of the gas turbine technology companies, for example, have plans on the books and they're, they're doing the research necessary to make that happen. We've discussed battery storage. Pump storage, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Geothermal is, is something that historically hasn't been an opportunity for us here in South Texas, but technology, again, is changing and may create, a, may create an opportunity for us. And, of course, compressed air storage. This slide here. Hey, Penny, is, before yes. we move forward, I did see a, a hand raised from Tom Corser. Oh, okay. Thanks very yeah. much, Melissa. Um, Benny, this is this is great data, and I really appreciate this. Um, on your first data chart that you showed, I think you answered my question on the following one, but I'm going to ask it anyway just for clarification. Um, when you speak about our generation, these are CPS electric owned assets that generate electricity for uh, your our service area. Um, I, I, I guess my question is, how do I reconcile that? How do I look at this data with respect to what ERCOT might put in, right? In terms of managing the the larger grid that's out there, how do I think about that? Okay, so we're, clearly we're a subset. I, I guess uh, uh, about a seventh, I believe, of total ERCOT load. What this uh, generation we're showing here is what we actually own and it's also what we contract for. We use power purchase agreements for solar and wind. We, we do that because there's tax credits there that we're not in a position to monetize as a municipal utility. By contracting for those, others are able to take advantage of those tax credits and we get the benefit in terms of a lower cost that we pass along to our customers. So, so are uh, those wind are those wind farms in your service area, or those could be wind farms kind of anywhere? I, I no, don't sir. No, sir. The the wind farms are scattered throughout the state. We have inland wind, west wind, we typically term it, and then we have coastal wind. Yeah. Uh, and of course, they each have different operating profiles. And, and we can we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I'll have a slide that'll give you a little bit of information on that. Uh, solar is the same thing. We 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 really wouldn't want all of our solar in one place because a little bit of cloud cover will lower the output. So makes sense. We we've, we've sought to get solar plants sites scattered throughout the coastal and western region of the state in an effort to make sure we've always got the most reliable source of solar we can have. Now, in terms of thinking about us relative to ERCOT, we're a piece of ERCOT. The way the market works is we sell our generation, we bid our generation into the ERCOT market every day, and then we buy back the generation we need. And what that does is give us a natural hedge so that we're covering our position and that we can control the maximum price that our customers pay. We, we can protect that. And so sell in, buy back every day. Uh, so if there's... Yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I, I apologize. I, I want to get to uh, uh, Dr. Contu's question, which is a great one. But but if you look at 2021 and the diversification that's represented there between renewables, mm -hmm. nuclear, coal, and gas, is that is, can we look at that as sort of typical of other areas of Texas, or are other areas of Texas in terms of the top generators that feed into ERCOT it, uh, is that substantially different, or is that similar? So larger companies will have a mix of some level 
we may we're a little higher in renewables. Uh, number one in the state is what you'll hear from time to time. And of course, we, we have nuclear. I can tell you that Vistra, which is a large supplier to the north, NRG to the to the southwest, uh, uh, southeast rather, excuse me, has a pretty good mix of coal, gas, and uh, nuclear as well, because they're they're in partnership with us on the South Texas project. Hmm. And some utilities are just straight gas play. Others uh, buy all their power from the market, which would expose you to a combination of, of these. All right. Okay. Does, Thank you very much. Help? I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I can't see Dr. Cantu's question. Um, yeah, thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, almost afternoon. Thank you for uh, the presentation. My question is looking from 2010 to 21 and the reduction in coal from 30% to 18%. Um, so I, we, we have a high, at this point, a higher percentage of renewables that we're using than coal. Is that correct? And is that only wind and solar or are there others? And then I have a follow-up question. So wind and solar, plus we have a small amount of landfill gas, okay. renewable natural gas. Okay. And then um, was the decrease in coal, was that only due to the closing of Dealey? Was there anything else done between 2010, 21 to account for that decrease in coal? Uh, no, ma'am. That, that's, that's what we've seen is when we shut down Dealey, a fair amount of generation went away, and that, that pushed us more into the gas area. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I'm having a technical problem here. Working to resolve. Okay. Uh, were there any other questions out there before I move on? There are no other questions in the chat, Benny. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to resolve this. I have a problem with Zoom. I don't believe this. Apologies, folks. As a backup, we can call up the presentation on our side. Okay. That, that might may need to get you to do that in just a second. I've got one more trick up my sleeve. All right. Man, haven't had this one before. We can go ahead and take it, Benny. All right, I'll tell you what, if you would please, and I apologize because I am I'm struggling to get this thing back on. And no yes, worries. As we're looking to move forward, what does nameplate mean? Okay, so nameplate is what the equipment that we have is, in, is rated for. Uh, that is to say, with our generators, for example, it's the maximum generation they can produce. Okay, got it. Hey, Thank Vaughn, you. I don't know if you're sharing. It doesn't look like you're sharing yet, and I think I've got control again. Uh, let me go back. We, we have it on our side. Hang on. Uh, okay, sorry. It wasn't showing up on my screen. Folks, apologies. I'm normally a little more technically competent than this. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think you got back on quicker than we did, so go right on ahead. All right. Well, let, let's move forward then. Okay, so this slide here, again, is an, uh, just an overview of the things we need to do between now and 2030. Uh, as you can see from the presentation, we've got our, you know, I don't know what's going on here. We've got our gas toll, uh, 500 megawatts will provide some firming power. We're looking at an option in the out years, and we're adding solar and storage. These three elements are what, we termed our flexible path, uh, flex power bundle. We're moving forward to get that in place today. Uh, so we're, we're covered for the near term, but we've got some future retirements that are on the horizon and we've got a transition on our coal unit that's on the horizon. Uh, approximate dates are shown here. 
What we've got to do is continue to work through the transition process, and, and that's, this is really what's driving our gen planning process, and this is where we're looking for guidance from our board. So just give you a sense of timeline. This, uh, this slide is intended to just present the big picture in a little different way. Bottom line is we're working with our rate advisory committee, your team, and community feedback as we develop some models in an effort to determine the best path forward. You can see where our renewables are, are intact and growing, nuclear, and then our gas fleet. Now the question is, what do we do with spruce? And we're working through a scenario process now. So spruce could go to gas, this 9% could transition this way, or it could move over here to renewables some other technology. That, that decision just has not been made yet, but it's out there. And I'm sorry, what are the, um, what are the, the fuel for the summers one, summers two? Th those are natural gas units. I see. So yeah, are, are coal, are, are, are spruce? Yes, sir, that's correct. Well, if summers one and two are gas, are gas you're, th those are retiring as well. Yes, yeah. ma'am. These are very these are very old units. Okay, because they're old because of the age. Okay. They they are absolutely aged. Remember, most of our fleet was designed when the market to serve a market that's pretty well gone today. What we're seeing is a significant shift in, in generation output. We're seeing load changes that are behaving differently. And these units were not designed for that. They, they were really designed for the regulated market. Renewables bring a lot of benefits, but they also bring some challenges, wind in particular, because it changes output so quickly. And so because of that, our existing thermal generation has to respond more quickly than it would otherwise. And, and that's part of the reason people have an interest in storage, uh, because storage can release load much faster than we can uh, spin units up and down. Accelerate, decelerate your car is probably a good way to think about that. I, I have a follow-up question on that slide. I'm sorry, the one you just had up? Yes, ma'am. When you're looking at the whole pie, mm -hmm. does this represent the use of each um, customer or each person or business that has a bill with CPS? that they get 28% renewables, 12% nuclear, 25% gas, or does business look different than a residential customer in terms of spread? No, I, what, what you're gonna see is this is where we pull our generation from. Okay. And at different times during the day, you'll, you may see more emphasis in one area than another. Okay. You know, for example, okay. That, th thank you, that answers it, yeah, thank you. And, and, and Benny, if I could get in a quick one as well. Um, yes, sir. What do you mean when you say retire? Uh, in other words, you've got a, a plant out there, a physical plant uh, that that is, like you said, aged and, and kind of ready to uh, to retire. I'm going to use the word in the definition, but but retire. But does that mean you'll re take that that footprint and put a new plant on it of some other technology? or rebuild uh, the gas generation capabilities such that now it's more modern? And how do we think about retirement that way? So retirement means we'll discontinue using that, that plant and we could reuse the site. It's really gonna depend on the economics. Uh, what we'll do is the best value for our customer. If it's cheaper for us to go somewhere else and use something else, that, that's what we'd advocate for. Uh, so it, it's really gonna depend. There, there are potentially opportunities out there in the area of geothermal, for example, uh, that we could reuse some of that existing equipment. Uh, it's something we're starting to explore. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. I, I've got a slide. Yeah, because it, it, I, I would anticipate that if you're going to take, for example, summers one, you're going to retire and you're going to not use that space there is a cost associated with that decision, and I, I would assume you'll capture that in the economics, right? Yes, sir. 
Yes, Good. sir. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? Okay. Okay, this slide here is a little bit busy, but it's intended to show you over here on the, the left side, just give you a good idea of what a typical day can look like with, with the different uh, renewable fuels. As, as you know, solar peaks during the uh, hottest part of the day, and then it, it fades off again in the evening. And then we've got our wind. And coastal wind, as you can see, is pretty consistent. We typically do see a dip in west wind uh, during the day, actually around peak when it gets the hottest. So the, the two go together nicely. And, and that's why it's important to have diversity in your wind also. The, uh, uh, we've got the rough numbers here, but during the summer peak period, for example, it's important to note that our traditional generation and storage 100% availability is what we can expect out of it because of the energy sources, whereas the west wind typically is around 20%. And you're talking about a 24-hour day. Coastal wind is about 57% with solar being about 50. About half the day, nothing's happening. And then finally, landfill gas runs about 76% on average. So th these are just considerations as we try and build out a portfolio. And this is a slide just talks a little bit about our evolution. You can see here we, we, we've got to provide power on demand. That, that's what our customers want and need. And so our challenge is making that happen. We've talked about emerging technologies, and we will here shortly, uh, that can provide controllable power. Geothermal is, is one, we believe, and we think new techniques will allow us to perhaps use it here in our area. Combined cycle is not new. We, we have two of the units today. In fact, that's a picture of one over there on the right-hand side, our, our Rio Nogales facility that we actually bought to replace uh, uh, our Dealey units when we retired those. But what is new is the 100% hydrogen and even potentially a carbon capture system. Uh, both of those are areas where we can use existing technology and transform it reuse it, if you will, based on your earlier or question there, uh, to uh, better align with our future. And then there's small nuclear uh, reactors, small modular nuclear, nuclear reactors are called. It's, it's still in the research phase, but there, there's a lot of work going on there. There may be something there for us. Obviously, we have the South Texas facility. We're, we're comfortable with our ability to manage nuclear energy. And so this will be something for discussion. Uh, merging technologies can also provide long-term storage. Batteries today are good, but they're, they're short-term. Short Lithium-ion batteries good for an hour or two, typically. Well, other technologies around air, for example, offer extended duration, up to a couple of days, typically. You, you compress air. In fact, you can even further compress it and go to a liquid storage of air that you can convert back. Geomechanical pump storage, we're going to talk about that in just a second. And iron flow batteries are starting to get some interest. So that, that's one we've got our eye on and we're talking to people. And in fact, we've got a call set up, I believe, next week with a, a company that's, that's doing that. We, uh, we, we've got an innovation council set up through Epicenter, uh, a group we help get off the ground. And uh, we're, we're looking at a lot of new technology as it starts to come into the market. Key takeaways, I guess, for our process here, just, just to reinforce. We've got aging plants we're, we're going to have to replace. We've got intermittent renewable generation that we have to find a way to support with power on demand because of the, the variable output. Diversity is still key for us to maintain cost and reliability. And finally, these innovative technologies that are out there uh, have hold the promise of allowing us to continue to do what we've always done, reliable, affordable, environmentally responsible generation. We're, we're going to pull in every string we can find to, to make that happen. So underscore thoughtful planning is key. Talk a little bit about geothermal uh, 
generation here. This is a uh, an existing uh, technology that's been around for a long time. It's very popular in Southern California, for example, and, and Western U.S. You'll you'll see a lot of small plants. I had an opportunity to tour a 14 megawatt facility in New Mexico uh, here earlier this year, and what they typically do is extract hot water from the ground, pull the heat out of it through above ground heat exchanger, and they have a turbine generator, not unlike the technology we use, only significantly smaller. And then the cooled water is reinjected into the ground for reheating. And of course, and all this is based on what they show here is cracks. Uh, the cracks allow the water to, to move underground and heat up within the, the resource. So th this is the way geothermal has been handled for many, many years, and it works well where it works. The, the geology here in Texas doesn't lend itself to this without going incredibly deep, and the, the cost has just been prohibitive. However, there's some companies that have moved into the market, and they've worked with advanced directional drilling techniques. To, uh, when I say directional drilling, uh, what that means is they're able to drill a vertical shaft, and then they're able to turn and branch out laterally. And, and move a distance uh, horizontally to the surface. They, they can use that technology to essentially build a radiator underground. That, that's a game changer. That gives us the ability to go to places where you've got temperature, but not necessarily water, uh, where you don't have the, the cracks, the permeability is what the geologists call that, in the rock that allows water to move. And, and they can build in these radiators. That's something that's got us pretty excited because we're seeing that as a technique that may open the door for us here in San Antonio. So we're, we are cautiously optimistic on this. We're engaging outside experts, in, including uh, NREL, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, to help us with this. And we'll be talking more about that here in the, in the coming weeks and months. But we are we are solidly focused on this one as a, as an alternative to coal. It gives us dispatchable generation uh, on demand, power on demand, to meet the needs of your customers, and at the same time, effectively integrate renewable energy sources such as wind and solar. Any questions or thoughts on this one? Uh, Melissa, do you want to handle Frank's question first? Please, Frank, I know you had a question. Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask for our retiring units, how much life cycle do they have remaining and what's an efficient rating you will use to determine um, how long each each uh, generation has before we have to consider that either it's it's past its prime or it's time to new to other sources? Okay, so... Typically, generating units will last 50 to 60 years without significant upgrade. Uh, in, in our case, the, the unit here, why don't, why don't I go back to that? That'll, that'll help. In, in our case, when you, you look at these units, and, and this is probably as good as any, uh, the, these, these units were commissioned uh, in the 60s, and they're, they're long in the tooth. The metric we use to decide when it's time to retire them is the cost to maintain them and their ability to serve the market. And, and by that I mean we, we have to look at fuel efficiency, we have to look at uh, the unit's ability to speed up and slow down based on market demands. And then of course we look at the condition of the equipment. Uh, the, these plants are at or actually Bronick is a little beyond. It's, uh, design life, and it costs more money to keep it going. It's, it's like an automobile. You, you can take a, you, you see people that have early Model A Fords, they're still on the road. Not economical, but they're still on the road. You, you can put a lot of money into these, but it's not in the customer's best interest to do that because you still lack the efficiency and market support capabilities of new technology that's less expensive. And so it's a, 
there's not a single number we use, but it's what does it cost, what's it giving us, uh, versus what new technology is available that we can use. Does Frank, does that help? Yes, it does. I, and then uh, I, my part two of that question is on terms of our wind farms and solar uh, panels. I know um, I'm, I'm very familiar with them because of we have to do permits for them and, and do special projects to establish them. Mm -hmm. And talking with some clients that operate those, I wanted to ask CPS, what's our maintenance looking like for wind farms and solar panels? And what do we do with the ones that drop in production? Like, do we tear them down? Do we let them live out to the life cycle is done? Like, what, what do we do to the failing units for solar panels and wind farms? So we, we monitor output. The, the wind farms are contracted. And the, the people that own those are investors. And so they monitor pretty closely their, their cost versus benefit. And I can tell you that we've had some of our power purchase agreements that the owners have come back and said, we're losing efficiency. We're going to replace these turbines with new turbines. And we wind up talking through an extension or something that whatever is in our best interest is what we negotiate to and accept. But uh, long and short of it is they replace those turbines. Solar panels will be the same way. We haven't had solar units, solar facilities out there long enough to start reaching end of life. I can tell you we've had solar facilities that have issues with inverters, for example, the device that converts the DC power the solar panel generates into AC power that we push out on the grid. Well, we replace those inverters. Uh, panels can be damaged. I think it was, I want to say about 2017, when we had some really, really bad hailstorms move through the area. And OCI Solar had one site where the hail was uh, basically uh, grapefruit size, softball size. A lot of panels were damaged, and so they had to replace those. Uh, we're, we're talking on the order of 15,000, I think, panels. But uh, with the solar panels, you replace them. Uh, again, if there's an issue with the equipment, you, you just replace it. But there's not a lot of maintenance on those facilities. I, I guess the first thing I, I thought of when I saw that this has been a lot of years ago, was what happens when they get dirty? Well, surprisingly, the impact of that buildup is not big, but you do clean them from time to time. And they've got little monitors out there on the sites that will tell you about when to do that. So all of this equipment is monitored, and people make uh, decisions to do maintenance or replacement just based on that ongoing efficiency, really the same way we do with our thermal plants. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Yes. Before I'm sorry. we move on, just doing a quick time check. You know, we um, we're we're gonna we're right right at about time. I know we started ten minutes late, so I tacked on another ten for you. Um, but uh, you know, if if we can maybe just accelerate just a tiny bit, I apologize, sir. No, no, no problem at all. I I really appreciate the questions, and I'm happy to come back in the future if you want to talk even deeper about specific topics. One thing I did want to get to, and I have it up on the screen now. Geomechanical pump storage. We have a pilot program that we're working through now. It's, as noted here, one megawatt, 10 hour, with QuidNet. And what they do is they've reversed traditional hydropower. You know, in hydropower, normally you've got two ponds, and you, you move the water from pond to pond, and depending on the time of day, you either pump water up or you run it back down and you generate electricity with it. QuidNet has discovered a way through deep geological injection to do the same thing in a flat area. Well, we're relatively flat here. And so we've got this program going on. Really excited to see how this, how this works. Uh, they're, they're, they're moving forward now, and so far everything's looking pretty good. I, I'm expecting a report out here soon from them, an update. But really excited about this opportunity because it brings what is traditionally a, a mountainous area energy storage technique to us here in our relatively flat San Antonio area. So can't say enough about what this one can do for us. This is a great example of storage where we can move power from 
off-peak periods when prices tend to be very low to on-peak periods where prices are high. I mean, said differently, prices, demand is low at night and it's very high during the day. So excited about this one. Any questions on this one? Okay. Well, so just to recap, uh, our generation planning process is on track. We're working through reviews uh, and we expect to be able to make recommendations to our board by the end of this year. We're looking at new technology. We're spending a lot of time on that. As I said, we've stood up an innovation council with our, our team at Epicenter, and we're looking at a lot of new technology. Myself and others in our business, Jonathan Tiarina in our business development area, we're, we're scouring for these opportunities and we're digging in. And so if you want to talk more about some of this stuff, we're happy to come back and do that with you. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. Any, any final questions? been really helpful. Thanks, Benny. I really appreciate it. This is exciting stuff. So glad to hear it. It well, looks like we thank, uh, thank you, sir. Based on the appreciate questions it. we got and, and the uh, the continuing interest, I think we'll we'll have you back to talk more in detail at some point. Thank you. Happy to do that. Benny, thank you so much. Uh, I always, you know, like like Bill was saying, this it is very interesting. I love hearing about this these developments as they come. And, and very much, uh, you know, hold in high regard the innovation that we're looking at. Don't be surprised if we knock on your door and ask you to come back here soon. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. That's okay. WebEx happens. Have a great day, <laughs> Benny. Thank you so much. Thanks. You all, too. <laughs> okay. So I like that. Gonna... WebEx happens. <laughs> WebEx happens. <laughs> Okay, well, now we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Ms. K.J. Fetter. Uh, Ms. K.J. Fetter is our VP of Community Engagement and Corporate Responsibility. Res Responsibility. And, you know, under her purview, again, you know, the community engagement portion to our corporate responsibility team, where we engage with community stakeholders and various groups, uh, you know, to support our community. Um, and in addition, you know, we have uh, equity, community, strategy, uh, and engagement, you know, in, in K.J. shop. And that, you know, that the team does, uh, that particular team led by Jesse Hernandez does a lot of work with interacting directly with our customers, whether it's on a proactive basis, like the community events, for example, that I read to you at the beginning of the program, uh, or, you know, when we have, uh, you know, customers that need to be uh, reached out to, you know, during outages and storms, uh, they, they do a huge and heavy lift uh, to try to provide customer support in that regard. So, KG, are you ready to roll? I am ready. Can you hear me, Vaughn? Yes, we can. Thank you so much, Mary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for letting me be here today. I, I really appreciate it. Um, Yvonne, thank you for that introduction to my team. You know, I also have the corporate responsibility side of the business that handles all of our volunteer work in the community, all of our um, sponsorships and engagement with different um, trade organizations and memberships with chambers of commerce, in addition to the community engagement side that handles um, education and outreach um, to our community. So one of the things that I wanna do, if it's okay with you all, is I'm gonna stop my video because WebEx happens, and I wanna make sure that I have enough bandwidth to my laptop to make sure that we're, um, you know, you all can see the presentation, and then I'll jump back on camera, you know, in between if you have questions or at the end of the presentation. So let me stop that really quickly. And we will go ahead and get started. Um, the presentation that you're going to see this morning is one that Deanna Hardwick, my boss, and I created um, so that she could present to the Municipal Utilities Committee with the City of San Antonio. And I get the pleasure of sharing the same presentation with you today. So we'll just go ahead and get right into it. Um, here's our agenda. What we really want you to take away from this presentation is that we're working to align with the City of San Antonio, which is our owner, and also our other stakeholders as we pull together our research and then we ultimately set our equity approach. This slide right here is one that's taken straight from the Office of Equity's training program. It describes the purpose of the Office of Equity. And as we learn more about equity and we lay out the foundation of what equity means to CPS Energy, we're learning from many of our stakeholders, including our owner. This slide will show you um, that we're researching various organizations that will help us build out a comprehensive equity strategy moving forward. One organization that does this for utilities across the nation is eSource. They work to help utilities come up with an energy equity framework. 
and then a path forward that consists of these major milestones. So we're going to start with defining and measuring what equity means to CPS Energy. We're going to engage our stakeholders. That means our community and our customers. We'll be designing and implementing programs, and then we'll go through that process where we evaluate those programs based on feedback and we make adjustments in order to move forward. There are many utilities across the nation that are doing these kinds of things, and they're incorporating equity into their marketing and their communications, their internal operations, and even their trade ally engagements. This is really new to the utility industry, and so we're kind of, um, some people like to say, building the plane while we're flying it, right? We're learning about our customers' needs, um, their challenges, and then we're modifying the programs and services that we offer in order to remove barriers and to improve access. And like I said, we're seeing that happen all across the country. Um, according to the American Council of Energy Efficiency and Economy, energy burden is defined as the percentage of gross household income that's spent on energy costs. I know that's a little complicated, so I hope that this uh, graphic here helps you understand that. But like so many other things, when you have outsized energy burden, it becomes an equity issue that disproportionately impacts low income and minority communities. Last year, we, um, we enlisted Brattle Group to help us understand more about what energy burden is. It was a term that some people in our organization were not familiar with at all. And we also wanted to understand what it looks like for our customers. And according to Brattle, and consistent also with what we see from energy equity broadly, there are many components of energy burden. While socioeconomic does play a factor, so do things such as location, housing characteristics, and even behavioral factors. What you'll see on this slide is data was pulled by Brattle from 2010 to 2019, and we asked them to do that to begin a study and to look at a cross-section of cities for us to compare. So the aggregated data here gives us an average view by each city. As I mentioned earlier, there are different components that contribute to energy burden, but one of those areas is income. And because of the higher income levels, you can see here that customers in Austin and in California actually experience the lowest energy burden. But also you can see here that San Antonio customers experience energy burden that is lower than the average customers in Texas and in the United States. And that's largely in part to our lower rates compared to the state and the national average in both electricity and gas. If you look here, well, la the last slide showed the average level for each city, but we what we wanted to do was take a deeper look into the data. And we wanted to use industry standards to look at income split into quintiles. So from lowest to highest, what you can see here is that we're looking at about 20% of the population in each quintile. Brattle defined the five income quintiles for our community and for our, our closest large metropolitan neighbors. So you can see Austin, Dallas, and Houston are on this slide as well. The average income interval mean, which is over here on the lower right-hand side, shows the ranges and the interval means for the third income quintile households. So for San Antonio, the third income quintile is close to 59,000, which for a family of four is a little bit above the federal poverty level. As you'll see on this page, you see income at each quintile. And if you look at this dark blue line, I hope you can see my corner here, this dark blue line is San Antonio income at each quintile. So you'll see that San Antonio residents earn less than Austin, Dallas, and Houston residents. And that's something a lot of us assumed and we've heard in the news, but we wanted to have the data to look at um, so that we can make sure we have that to back up the research that we're doing. So just hey, like hey. yes. We do have a question from Dr. Ken too in the chat. Okay, great. I can't see the chat, so I'd love to hear the question. Uh, thank you. I, I, I'll go ahead and say, does energy, does the San Antonio energy burden include the number of residents that have been disconnected or behind on their payments? So energy burden is literally the cost, the household income cost compared to the the cost of energy. So how much you make compared to how much you spend on energy. Okay, so. Um, so that's not that's not included or there it's not in that um right it's not included in the data okay yeah Thank so you. like right now um we actually haven't been charging 
Are, are you asking about like additional charges? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, just overall. Okay. Okay. So despite the fact that households in San Antonio have a larger, have a lower income on average than Dallas and Houston, um, we we're learning that that's primarily driven by Dallas and Houston's higher electricity bills. So one thing that we believe is the biggest contributing factor, and also Brattle has told us that it's due to consumption. And so that's why we think our step program is going to be so important in our approach as we build out our equity strategy, because that program helps people reduce their usage. And then also with the most recent rate increase, the lowest income quintile energy burden remained the same. So we were able to make changes in our affordability discount program so that the customers who have the lowest income wouldn't see any impact due to the rate increase. And then additionally for the second quintile with those ADP changes, it reduced the amount of impact that that rate increase had from 4.3% to about 3.9%. So overall, we know that we need to understand that information more in depth and ensure that we're taking a measured approach to how we build out our equity program moving forward. So uh, could I ask you a question, KJ? Absolutely. On your prior slide, yep. uh, you, ha you have a, a metric there, the ACEE -E -E uh -huh. energy threshold burden. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that, that 6%. So that's what they, um, the American Council of, oh goodness, I can't remember the, the, um, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. That's the energy burden that they define is um, considered a high energy burden, that 6%. A high energy burden. Okay. Yeah. And so, so, uh, the, the first quintile that you have there, uh, where we're at about like 9.5%, what looks like about 9.5% in San Antonio, um, is is that with all the programs that we've had? I know we've had a, a number of programs for our low income segment over the past, uh, you know, over the COVID uh, days. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, that's inclusive of that. So it can be because remember, energy burden is what you spend on your energy bill compared to your household income. So if your bill is brought down because you're consuming less then that part is included. But if you're getting assistance on a bill that you already have, then that isn't measured, right? So you get a, for affordability discount, you get a discount on your bill. So you'll see that as an impact in, in energy burden in this data. And then um, as you, you use less, that also impacts and brings down your energy burden. But if you okay, get so money from the city of San Antonio or from a, a nonprofit agency that helps you pay your bill, then, then there's not a way to to show that in energy burden percentages, but we do know that it helps um, customers have more income because they're spending less on energy. I see. So, so the the uh, subsidies is not included in this data. In that, uh, well, I guess I, I'm confused because are you saying it would be included because that would be considered income and that would be counted on the denominator of your equation? No, because we wouldn't be able to measure. So we're taking average incomes, right? So what's what is an average income? Uh, okay. Yep. So you you wouldn't really be able to see that to measure it. Okay. So, so that nine point five percent is 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 probably overstated with the great deal of programs that we've had, correct? You could say that, yes. But then that's probably true of of Austin, Dallas, and Houston as well, right? Exactly. exactly. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yep. Sure. This yes. is this is how the leads came to. I have another question. I guess it's more of a an upstream issue. Uh huh. Are we ever going? I mean, let me ask this question: Can CPS resolve this issue when we know that San Antonio is so segregated by income, so that unless there's an increase in wages? We're going to remain where we're at with energy burden. I, I, I'm not sure I'm seeing where more programs will help. Not at not uh, as as increase in wages. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it would be more of what we would want to get to it. Right. So, first of all, I think that um, the things that we can do to help reduce usage have a major impact. 
right? Because then they end up with a lower bill. But there are other things that the community can do to help increase wages, right? We can right. help with education. We can bring more organizations to San Antonio, and you know, and where we are players in all of that. You know, we participate in in those activities, all for the good of our community, which will then also hopefully, you know, impact wages as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. I. I... Yeah, yeah. I, I have to reflect on it more, but you know, looking at it from upstream, yep. we know that um, wages and the lack of increase in wages is certainly driving this as well. Absolutely. Yes. Hey, Dr. Dr. Cantos, Jesse Hernandez, if I could chime in for a second. Um, I just wanted okay. to add, uh, as we're looking at any programs, right, we're, we're looking at energy burden and, for example, the, the cost of the program, we're, we're going to be evolving that program. And energy burden is going to be a com big component of that where now not just the income piece of it is going to come into play, but we'll look at the whole holistic energy burden plus census tract to focus on those areas. And that's going to allow more customers to qualify that might have been outside of the original scope of the program as we have it today. So we'll continue to do that with not only that program, but all of our other programs across the board as well. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. And I was actually getting to that, but I appreciate you jumping in and, and sharing that information now because it was a great place to add it. Um, if you want, we can jump quickly into the next slide. This one um, is just another slide from the City of San Antonio's Equity Office. So here we're learning that we need to understand our history. We also have to find ways to abstain, to obtain and to store and protect and leverage the appropriate customer information so that we can ensure we're taking a holistic approach to moving forward. And so here's where we talk about um, some of our programs. Um, for years, we've offered programs um, and various solutions to our customers that help address equity and they combat the energy burden. Some of them are reactive. That's kind of how I like to think about it. So those programs will help customers find ways to cover their energy bills, um, income-based discounts, assistance programs, and payment arrangements. But then other programs are proactive and those programs help reduce usage. So that's our weatherization program, in a, any um, efficiency rebates that we can offer, and then also demand response programs. Those kind of change behavior and they help reduce the usage, which, help, which helps reduce the overall bill. But we know that we've been offering these for a while and utilities across the entire country um, have very similar programs. What we're learning is that the community in general, what they wanna see is their, their definition of equity in energy has grown, right? They're expecting utilities to help actively combat the energy burden. They want to see us develop more in-depth equity strategies. And so we have to build on these as we work on our new STEP program and any of our other services um, and also apply an equity lens to even just our basic outreach and our communication. And that's something we've act actually already started doing. So as Jesse and his team are going out into the community, we, we learned even in the beginning of COVID that we had to adjust the way we outreach because customers couldn't electronically always connect to us and we couldn't connect with them electronically because there are a lot of people who can't, um, who don't have access to connect with us electronically. And so we've started um, with our in-person events, we're including non-digital outreach. We're going out, in fact, the team was out, out knocking on doors recently um, talking to customers, encouraging them to come to our events. We do phone calls, we do door hangers, we, we go into their neighborhoods and we connect with them in a way that's familiar to them and help encourage them to meet with us and talk about their energy needs. If you look at the next slide, um, I wanted to give an example of that. Um, in November, the city council set aside about $20 million in American Rescue Plan Act for our, for our customers. Um, we changed our outreach approach, so we looked at we wanted to be more equitable, so we looked at the neighborhoods that had the largest number of past due bills, but we also overlaid um, neighborhoods with high energy burden, and we focused our efforts in those areas. And we wanted to do outreach that was convenient and familiar for those customers, so we went and knocked on doors. We set up tents at the, you know, in the park in their neighborhood or in the um, church parking lot, wherever we could find, you know, and be allowed to set up a tent so that we could talk to customers where they felt comfortable. So through that process, and then also through online applications and phone calls, as of May 31st, we've received over 17,000 applications for ARPA support. And we're in the middle of processing those applications and working to ensure that all of our customers get the maximum benefit from that program. Another thing that we've changed is through our rate request, um, we had a goal of enrolling 13,000 additional, additional customers in our affordability discount program. 
So we're doing that a little bit differently too. We're partnering with Department of Human Services, Neighborhood Housing and Services, the San Antonio Housing Authority, and CareLink to identify, um, pre-identify income qualified customers and also reach new customers, right? So we can auto enroll anyone that's been income qualified through a City of San Antonio program, but then we also um, are reaching new customers through these avenues as well. And if you'll look at the next slide, you'll see that we have actually over 100 different agency partners that we work with in order to connect our customers with the assistance that they need. We use um, what Jesse refers to often as a case management approach. So we're not just talking to customers and helping them with their energy bill. We're talking to them holistically about their life and whatever they need. So if a customer needs food, clothing, diapers, legal aid, Whatever it is, if we have a, a contact and a partner agency that we can work with, then we will connect those customers with those organizations. So it's not just about getting their utility bill paid, but it's about helping them and change their entire life. And if you empower them to not have to worry about where their next meal is gonna come from, then they can focus on other things and the energy bill will eventually work itself out. So just to let you know, we're taking action, right? We're continuing to leverage all of our existing programs, but we're also focusing on enhancing our approach so that we can be more equitable for customers who have the highest energy burden. We're doing that lots of different ways. We're partnering with the city for on our equity approach. We're learning how to use the equity atlas and overlay that with our data so that we're in the neighborhoods where we need to be. We're targeting outreach and support on energy burden. And then we're also working with um, the rate advisory committee working with you all to get feedback and as we start to work through rate design, make sure that we're getting that information from our partners. And then lastly, created the slide just to let you know that we're, um, we're growing our internal education, right? As I said before, there were people in our organization that didn't even understand what energy burden was. Um, you know, very recently. So we're defining ways that we can ultimately remove barriers for our customers that have an equity approach that improves our outreach, that improves access, and that promotes awareness to the right products and services and support for our customers that need it the most. And that is all I have for you. Thank you, KJ. Absolutely. Is there any any additional questions for KJ? I, I can definitely I, tell you that uh, you know equity and energy burden are topics uh, and concerns that are definitely front of mind, um, you know, to not only our board of trustees but members of the San Antonio City Council. So I'm you know quite confident that all of you, you know, as representatives in our community, will continue to you know be asked questions about that. And of course, you know, we're happy to give you opportunities to learn more about it. I think I heard someone wanting to ask a question there. The, 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 uh, this is how the Lita can too. So I, I just run into so many people in the community that aren't aware of, of the programs. And I'm just, I guess it's more so reflecting on myself is how do, how do we best advise CPS in, in, in getting the word out and getting people engaged in this? Um, so I, I don't have any, any, easy, any easy answers and I'm sure CPS doesn't either, but I'll continue reflecting on that. Uh, certainly I, I refer people, you know, yes. to explore all those different avenues. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure what that, that gap is. And yeah. I, 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 I can't tell you what it is. It's just that this is what I'm in, hearing in the community. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and definitely right now is just the anxiety level is so high. People are afraid to look at their CPS bills. I talked to at five in them yesterday John. who were who were afraid to open it up. Um, Absolutely understand. Yeah. So anyway, I, I'm just putting that comment. I, not that I'm looking for any answers or anything else. It's just I, we're we're tasked with how best to advise you. Well, I think I appreciate that and I, I welcome the feedback. The one thing I want to say is, is um, please refer any customer to us that you talk to. Um, we do have more of a grassroots effort and approach to things on my team. Um, we are working closely with um, organizations like Southwest Workers Union. Um, we're working with communities and schools to train the people that work with them 
to help them understand what our programs are. Every year we have an annual power uh, partners in power meeting where we talk about our programs, but also let our partners uh, present and get to know each other um, so that we can empower our community to share our information, right? My team is very small and we've got lots of customers. And so while we're working to be better storytellers with our partners in corporate communication, we know that, that telling those stories through the newspaper and through social media isn't always the most effective way. Most of the people that we help are people that wanna be talked to in person. And we can only get to so many neighborhoods. So by, by empowering our partners and, and offering training and teaching them about our programs, you're letting customers who are already familiar with those organizations feel like they have a safe place to go and then they can connect with us or get the help that they need through those organizations. And the one thing I can say, again, this is how the data can too. I, the one thing I can say, and I, I don't have any hard data on it, but this is just um, a, an assumption I'd like to explore more. I, I still think there's a, 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 a trust issue uh -huh. that is uh, something that it, it explains the gap yep. or the uh, not wanting to reach out to CPS. And I don't know how to necessarily fix that. But just again, to put that out there, I, again, just the number of years I've worked in the community, Absolutely. that's just something I'm feeling, but no hard data to, to. So that's why I'm interested in, in, in the data on the effectiveness of the programs and what, what were some of the reasons that people did get into the programs? It might be yes, uh, be, uh, good to understand those reasons and then maybe redesign some strategies based on what those people are saying about uh, the benefits they've had from the program and using those kind of messages. I, again, just uh, I'm trying to think of ways to help advise in that way. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Hey, Dr. Hey. Hunter, it's uh, Jesse Hernandez. If I could just jump in for a second as well. Uh, one other thing that uh, we're going to be doing is we're going to be having uh, a role that we're calling the community ambassador that's going to be able to help us with that. Um, but even just this, this year alone, right, the, through the process that we're in now, we've, we've done hundreds of events and we're somewhere every single day. But as you're out there with your partners, I know your reach is, is far and wide. Um, but we can definitely have, have resources and scheduling them, um, uh, schedule various events. We, we can pop up, you know, for a couple hours or four hours, however, however it's necessary with our various mobile units. But uh, with that community ambassador that we're going to be having here soon, that's also going to be another avenue that's not only going to hopefully help us with additional funding and different uh, outreach options, uh, but just with the ability to be very much more grassroots, right? Uh, and, and we're also looking at other things like doing more of the block walking, maybe implementing some of the promotoras or something like that to, to really get onto the neighborhoods that, uh, to help us with that trust issue. I, I do agree with you on, on the trust, uh, and that's something that uh, my team and I will continue to work on, um, but I also think that we engage with the neighborhoods and, and those trusted um, you know, resources within the neighborhood that's gonna help us get there even better. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, and Jesse and KJ, I, I, I just wanna throw my uh, two cents towards the whole community engagement of other organizations because, you know, uh, Adelita's right on, right? There's a trust issue and for them to come directly to CPS is, is very tough, but they might have other trusted partners in the community and for you to train the trainer, basically train those other partners to come to CPS. I mean, 10% of your income going to one person is significant, right? Now, if you're talking rent, that's a little bit different, but that that's typically the bigger bill of anybody's income, but 10% due to electric is significant and having all of those partners that you listed on that sheet, right? Phenomenal, if they could all be aware that if somebody's in economic distress to say, hey, I can help you with some of that 10%, let's go together talk to CPS. And if you could grease the skids for them to come talk together, I think, you know, Dr. Cantu's right on with that. Absolutely, thank you for that. Thank you again, KJ and team. Um, you know, for this wonderful conversation and thank you to the committee, um, you know, for your input, you know, and willingness to help. So, with that, we'll go ahead and pause and chair day. I'll turn, uh, turn it back over to you for the time that you have left for agenda and closing. Uh, I'm sorry for round table and closing comments. 
Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, KJ, for that presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, I will um, I'll go around the call and and uh, see if we have any comments. I'll take a point of privilege and go first and say that um, first of all, that uh, it seems to me that both of those presentations that we had today came from committee members bringing questions or issues forth to this group. So I uh, really appreciate that and glad that we had staff respond to that. And then second, I just wanted to say that I appreciated this week, the communications from CPS Energy on energy usage, um, asking people to scale back, but also reminding everybody that CPS Energy is doing its part. Um, we're in great shape as far as generation goes. We're putting uh, lots of energy out there into the grid. Any problems that may result would be from the grid itself, not from uh, any of our generation falling short. So uh, it was good to see all that communication, really appreciate it. And even before that, with the when we had storms roll through and uh, updates on the outages and things like that, uh, communications is doing a good job. Um, okay, so I'll just, I guess, go in order. Uh, so starting with District 1, Richard, uh, anything that you want to bring forth right now? Uh, I'll just say that I uh, appreciate both presentations very much, learn a lot, uh, and uh, really appreciate the equity uh, approach and how that's that's shaping up. Um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but I had a customer service issue disconnecting from CPS recently because I sold my house. And um, I just want to share that because it, without going into too much detail, um, essentially, it had to do with the fact that my house was supposed to close on a certain day. So I called it, or I, I did a stop service request that was a day after closing um, to allow the new owner to transition. And then the push day closing got pushed back to the following week. And there's no mechanism in your. Cancel a stop service request. Um, except to try to start service again, which didn't make sense to me. So I tried calling and <clears throat> I had some issues with the callback system because I got disconnected from it twice. And right now when you call, it's an hour, an hour and a half for a callback, which is, that's fine. But then um, I, I just, I wanted to share that because it was an experiential moment. Um, I finally got through to somebody, but I had to to avoid an outage on the day of the outage that it was my service supposed to be uh, disconnected. And obviously, I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> so I had to select the option on the call for an, the outage service, which connects you to somebody within about 30 seconds, as opposed to a billing question or a service, uh, a, an other type of request, which takes about an hour and a half for a callback. Um, so <clears throat> I'd be, uh, I don't want to take up more time on it, but I just wanted to share that I had that and that issue and see if there's an opportunity where I could speak to somebody in more detail about that to, to see if there's a way to prevent other people from having to go through that. I think we can make arrangements to connect you with someone on the team. Absolutely. And were you wanting to Hi, come Richard, in? This is, I'm, I'm sorry, this is Deanna with Anne. And, um, we will follow up with you. We had a hard time. We lost your audio for a good chunk of that. Um, but uh, Yvonne, if you will connect us through so we can understand the issue. Um, just from, I think, the little parts that we heard at, at a high level, we do have priority for emergency outages in our, um, in our system. So if someone calls in, we are seeing extremely high wait times in our call center and our walk-in center. It is a combination of, I would say, three things. One is uh, the higher bill based on fuel charges, usage, and uh, some other components of your bill. Uh, the other piece is this is moving season, so we get a higher influx of, of moves. And then the third piece is uh, any outages that we do see. Customers are a lot more concerned specifically based on what they hear from ERCOT. So a lot, of, a lot more customers call us. And in those, uh, in those times, we do have an automated system to help us handle the, uh, the outage volume because we don't have the full staff. Uh, we are doing everything we can to hire more folks. We have classes starting just about every single month in our customer service team. Uh, but to understand and get through and, and the, the con constraints that you're seeing or kind of what you experience, we'd love to meet with you and, and see what we can do to get better. That sounds great. Yeah, I appreciate it. 
Thanks, Bill. I'll reach out later. Th I'll reach out later this afternoon. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank thanks you, Dan. Yes, thanks, Ian. Thank you. Oh, Deanne, sorry. Thank you, Deanne. Thanks, Richard. Okay, it looks like Lawson joined us. Uh, Lawson from District 2, do you have anything you want to bring forward? Yes, and apologies for being late to the call, but uh, I I know I missed some of a uh, chunk of the, the meeting. So I just wanted to, again, I wanted to echo what, what was said earlier about just thanking CPS for the communication and messaging uh, surrounding everything that's going on right now. Uh, I. I personally had a, a little bit of PTSD because my water line busted in front of uh, in front of my place, and so I have no water. And then got getting the alerts from about ERCOT was just uh, it was a little triggering. But I, I did I did want to just you know thank you guys for for the the messaging and, and being really you know engaged in that. So that was really good to see, and I'm 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 proud of of the efforts that was done at a local level. So thank you all. I know it's I know it's this is a stressful time for you all just as much as it is for us as residents. Thank you. Thanks, Lawson. Diana, you're up. I don't have anything right now, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Frank, do uh, you have anything for us? Yes, I have uh, two shout outs, both for the CPS team. The first one about last month. Thank you, uh, Melissa and CPS energy team, uh, emergency team for helping me with a client issue involving a gas line burst that happened on one of my sites. And I was able to connect with someone immediately from the emergency team to help us uh, fix the gas line rupture. Because it made my safety safety duties a lot easier knowing that I had someone on the line that I can call to make sure that everything everybody was protected. And two, um, I think this will happen this week. Thank you for handling the fire that happened at West Pyron and Halls, the substation fire. I know we lost power to about close to 4,900 people, but thank you for resolving that. I know equipment failures happen, especially it's roughest when we have a, we're in high peak and high heat. I think that happens to be the most common. It happens a lot in those areas, but thank you for handling that. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Raquel Zapata. I just had one question. There was a, um, I didn't want to interrupt the presentation earlier, but there was a reference to users being able to set up alerts to let them know when their gas bill or their electric bill was going to be high. And I'm just wondering if there's some instructions or something that can be sent out that we can share. Um, I've had a few residents in our district who have kind of posted comments around wishing they had a way of knowing that, and I'd love to be able to share instructions with them on how to find it. I was trying to go to the website myself and figure it out while we were on this call, but I was not able to find it. So if we had that, that would be very useful. Absolutely. We can send that to you after the meeting. Thanks, Raquel. Uh, Dr. Cantu, do you have anything else for us? Yes, uh, and I apologize. Um, I'll make it quick and I may go back to the trust issue that we spoke of earlier. Um, the process for uh, this is from residents and from other people who have been trying to make public comments during the trustee meeting. Um, the process of being of signing up for that, uh, it's a very limited period of time, the Friday before the Monday meeting. Um, there is a lot of. Uh, uh, angst that the reason that is the such strict guidelines is that CPS doesn't want to have customer input. My understanding is like 7 to 7 a.m. to maybe 1 p.m. that people call in, they put their name on the list. Um, and uh, I, and this certainly could be for the following month, if that could be on the agenda as to uh, the rationale for the process the way it is, so I can better explain that to the community. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Cantu. Um, I'm sorry, who was piping in, chiming in there? Was it Davey? It's Ashley Glotzer. Hi, Ashley. Thank you. Hi. So, Dr. Cantu, and, and for all of the CAC members, we have modified that for July and going forward, so we will have speakers sign up starting from once the agenda is posted, which is usually Wednesday and then through Friday at 1 p.m. 
and then you know we also if anybody does show up that didn't pre-register we will take them so you know it's more helpful for us to just have the pre-registration as an idea of who's going to speak but we have expanded that time so now it's you know um two full days and then also like i said for anybody that does come to the meeting that didn't get a chance to pre-register we will allow them to speak so i hope that's helpful yes very helpful and if that could be uh, certainly put on the website and I can, uh, and this is, is not just the July, this is going forward. This is going forward. Yes. And we have modified the language for our posting and we'll kind of continue to, to put that out there and I'll relay your comments to, um, our board relations team to see if we can, you know, continue to kind of let the public know that. Thank you. Thanks. Angelica. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I apologize. I skipped Andy. Castillo in District 5. Andy, do you have anything for us? Uh, no, uh, just thank you guys for all the hard work that you guys do, especially with uh, um, the heat that's happening right now. Um, and I'm, I'm just excited that you guys are still looking at or, you know, thinking outside the box and looking at other alternatives for, for energy. So uh, thank you guys again. Okay, uh, John Kelly, we're up to you. Um, you know, I think my comment would be uh, just pretty much about Benny Etheridge's presentation. I was really uh, encouraged by that. I think that it shows a lot of proactive future thinking there. And I, I think for me, that's something that's really encouraging to know that they're looking uh, out into the future. I'm a big, as I've mentioned before, I'm a big proponent of nuclear power. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more, maybe in the future, not next month necessarily, but sometime in the future, if we could have Benny come back and tell us a little bit more about the small nuclear power plants uh, option. I've read about those a little bit. I know a little bit about it, but I'd like to hear more from him uh, about that. Otherwise, I thought it was a great presentation today. I agree. That was uh, very interesting. and. and Love to hear more about some of those emerging technologies. Uh, Tom Corser, you had a question about onboarding. Uh, I don't have an update for you on that, but go ahead and ask him, and we'll see if we can get something moving on that. Well, I, you know, I, I thought it was a great topic to bring up as as we were bringing on new members to to have a a list of um, things to bring people up to speed, and and I would love to be included in that set of of needing to get up to speed on a lot of things. Uh, and so I think that would be really useful. You know, again, I don't want to burden the staff with pulling, uh, you know, doing a whole bunch of work on that behalf, but to the extent materials exist that could be kind of combined and, and put out on a shared drive or something for, for us to peruse through would, I think would be extremely useful. Um, and to that regard, you know, I'd, I'd second John's uh, state. Well, first of all, I'd second, you know, the response CPS has done with this whole heat thing. It, it has been uh, fantastic. Communications was 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 a, a shining star. So I, I want to thank everybody for that. But but what John said is, uh, you know, a lot of interesting things that Benny brought up today about power generation, uh, both past and future. I think I'd, I'd like to understand a lot more. Right. Um, and, and, you know, what, what is our, uh, kind of risk of staying with gas and, and, you know, replacing those gas powers with additional gas units, right? What is that future risk? What is, what does nuclear bring to us? Is, is that bring more risk or more benefit? Um, small nuclear, as, as John mentioned, is very interesting. Alternative, uh, uh, I'm very interested in that. Very interested in how quickly we could get rid of coal. So a lot of, a lot of interesting topics there around power generation that would be really interesting to learn. But the reason I go into all that is I'm not sure how the CAC can help. We can hear it, we can ask all these kind of questions about it, right, of the presenters, but I, I'm, I'm kind of bent towards helping and I'm not sure how we can do that. So I'd like to have John, or, or Bill, I'm sorry, a, a, a time and maybe our next agenda of trying to brainstorm a little bit more about how we can help, right? How we can help CPS decide things or influence things or analyze things. I don't know, but I I, I feel frustrated that we or me, I, I'm not helping as much as I think maybe I should. So that would be my comment for you, Bill. 
Sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. We can get that on the agenda for the next meeting. In the meantime, um, I, I think I've said this before. Every time I have a conversation with anybody that I encounter about CPS Energy or the CAC, I ask them to rank in in their preference. You know, what's more important to them? Is it affordable energy? Is it renewable energy? Or is it reliable energy? Which one of those things are all important? But which one of those three is most important to them? And so invariably it's like reliable. We want to make sure that the air conditioner is on all the time and the lights come on when we hit the switch. Great. Okay. So what that means is, you know, what does that mean to you in terms of how we generate the power and things like that? A lot of times they don't know, but just getting people thinking about that sort of thing and the balances that we have to, to go with, um, I think it goes a long way toward this because it's, it's discussions that we're going to be having going in the future. The rack is having those, the board is having those. Uh, we're all going to need to decide that as a community, uh, how we replace this energy. I think we all agree that we want to retire the coal plants and move on to something else, uh, but that something else has to be determined and yep. how quickly we need it. Those are, that's the big question. Good. Thank you, Bill. Allie, uh, anything for us? Um, I wanted to echo the, the sentiment um, of today's presentations. I thought they were extremely relevant and really interesting. And I always feel like it's a successful meeting when I walk away learning something new. Um, and to kind of echo what you were saying, Bill, um, anytime I have conversations with people in the community about CPS Energy, you know, they're, they're bringing up things like, hey, I got this email that said I was the 10th best energy user, or whatever, in my area, and I want to get to number one. How do I do that? I sat basically in the dark all day yesterday, and I was like, oh, well, did you have anything plugged in? She was like, yeah, does that draw energy? And I'm like, yes. So anyway, I think that that's just one of the, the many ways that, that we can still get involved is just keeping that conversation going and, and taking what we're learning in these these conversations and taking them to people in our everyday. So um, I, I fully believe that that communication funnel is where we help out and coming from like a friendly coworker face or neighbor face um, can sometimes just be that key. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I, I don't think Louisa or Mary is on the call or Andra, but Steve Bonnet is. Steve, do you have anything you want to bring to the group? Yes, um, a couple of things, um, you know, like John and Tom said, I thought the uh, uh, Benny's presentation was, was fantastic. Uh, I think we could go on for quite a while on that topic. I specifically am kind of like uh, John, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the South Texas nuclear power plant. Uh, a little more information about what the what the life cycle of that is and how how we're handling the, the controversial issues we've had over the years about nuclear power, what we're doing with waste and that sort of thing. So there's a lot lot I'd like to drill down on that and see where we're where we are and where we're going on that in the future of that. And also the idea of the of the small nuclear reactors. I'm really fascinated by that. So really like to hear more about that. And then one other item that just kind of confounds me sometimes is you know as we uh, as we um, surf the internet and we go to sites like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, once in a while I get these ads that say, oh, I've got this great uh, energy device that's gonna save you, uh, you know, tons of money and it's, and it's, and they imply that they're endorsed by CPS or they're somehow uh, tied to CPS, which I'm very doubtful of. And I, and I guess, uh, cause I get on the, uh, get on the internet and try to find some independent rating of what this thing really does and is it good or bad and I get mixed reviews. So I guess my 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 concern is is when they when they bring in CPS and say, oh yeah, CPS is all for this. I don't believe it. And I guess the question would be is if somebody wanted to find out, uh, does CPS know about this thing or they have have they reviewed it? Uh, have they you know endorsed it? I doubt that. How would a person follow up on something like that? When, whenever we have folks asking about, you know, what our position is relative to, uh, you know, it, like the environmental, um, I guess, what aspects, if you will, of certain types of generation, maybe, or the risk. 
Well, there's, it's, these, it's these like, um, I, I can't remember the specific, there are several different kinds of things, but it's something that, that they're selling to a person that's maybe a, 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 always somewhat associated with a generation or ability reduced um, uh, usage or something like that. And it's just some kind of device that says, you know, there's a, here's something that's, they don't, I don't know if they say it's endorsed by CPS, but they'll say something about CPS allowing uh. this to be used or that sort of thing. And it'd just be good to, there's a way that they can see if this is really legitimate. If our if these yeah. companies are using CPS as energies just for marketing purposes and misleading the public. Okay. But we, if you ever have any questions about that, let me know. Um, you know, we do utilize, you know, contractors, you know, and, um, you know, for our weatherization program, um, you know, but there are correct, there are different vendors out there, um, you know, that, um, you know, have a tendency to, to promote their products and make those statements. And, you know, we can, we have internal staff that can validate that for you. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You're That's welcome. all I have. I see we have a Thanks hand raised from Frank. Hi all. Mm. So, so talking about my my colleague's uh, question, I have seen some similar scams in my area and online. The ones mm. I've common ones I've seen are the ones sign up for solar, but they're none of the none of the people that are uh, promised the solar are even contracted or licensed in San Antonio or gone through the vetting program through CPS. And a lot of them are using the CPS name, saying, "Yeah, we're part mm. of CPS," and then later on they start bashing CPS for not not helping customers the other one that i've seen is a some kind of solar heater the one that you saw on the roof and then i also seen a mini uh windmill uh adaption connected to your house that will, will promise you to get you off grid and that that's guaranteed by cps those are the common ones i've seen okay thank you thank you for letting me know i'll be i'll i will talk with that, our team about that yeah, that's really good information. I see stuff on social media from time to time about um, warning customers of scams of people calling up and claiming to be from CPS. But this is something mm -hmm. as well that we need to be aware of. That if people are using the CPS name, we may need to make sure that they're vetted. Um, did I miss anybody in the roundtable? No? Okay, well, with that, I will thank everybody for staying a little late. Thank you for to the staff for putting everything together. Really appreciate it. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Here. Frank, second. Second. Got it. Diana, Frank, thank you very much. All in favor, say aye. That's it. Aye. Aye. We have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.